सत They found me on the main road. If the circumstances had been different, they said they would have thought I was just a woman out walking the dog, waiting on the curb as if to cross the road. Because the dog had on um, collar, harness and lead. But I was dressed in a nighty and red tartan wellies. It was two o'clock in the morning. It was early March and it was freezing cold. So clearly I looked out of place. And when they pulled over and asked me to get in the back of the car, I remember being grateful for the warmth of the car and for the kindness in their voices. But otherwise I was numb. That was the night that I'd fled. I'd made a run for it, convinced in my head that I was running for my life, which is why I probably just put on whatever footwear was nearest the door. And you'd probably think that that was my lowest point. It wasn't, the worst was still to come. Because despite the help of the wonderful ladies at Refuge and my solicitor and the court injunction, things actually got worse to the point where I intended to take my own life. I just needed to find a way of making the pain stop. I was lucky though, because I had a very strong social scaffold. I had people around me who stepped up. And one night I was on the phone to Samaritans and I was talking to a lady with a Scottish accent, a very gentle, kind voice. And she asked me to press pause and to think about whether there was another way. She convinced me that there was still hope. And in that moment, I remember I made my promise to the universe that if I survived, if I made it to the other side of that living hell, I would do for somebody else what she'd done for me. And so I made a promise to the universe that I would use my past to improve other people's futures. So once I'd recovered, I went and I studied and I qualified as a suicide intervention tutor with the National Centre. And now using that expertise, along with 25 years in the corporate world, helping to develop leaders and managers across all industries, I'm using the combination of my skills, my knowledge, my expertise, and obviously my personal experience, because I had a bloody good look at rock bottom. My name's Andrea Newton, and I want to work with organisations who are keen to create a mentally healthy climate for their employees. Not so that managers become counsellors or therapists or seek to fix the problem. But so, as decent human beings, as conscientious leaders, they can do the right thing by their people. Lots of organisations are aware of the costs of poor mental health, 35 billion cost to the UK economy, which equates to about £1,300 per employee. But I wonder what price people would put on the life of a colleague. The work that I do, I know works. I've worked with a housing association. 48 hours later, one of the trainees that was on the training had to use what she'd learned on my programme because they had a tenant in crisis. A supervisor with an engineering company recently had to do a conversation around redundancy. And again, because of the training he'd done, he was able to spot that all wasn't well and actually put steps in place to potentially save a life. So I'm not talking about managers becoming the problem solver, the fixer. I'm talking about people having practical skills, feeling more comfortable, more confident with sensitive subjects such as suicide and poor mental health. Employers know that they have a duty of care under the Health and Safety at Work Act, but they sometimes forget that that duty of care also extends to people's mental health. It isn't just about hard hat, high vis. We all have a responsibility. The Scottish voice, the lady that I've never met and probably never will, gave me that feeling of hope. And in my promise to the universe, 
I want to use my expertise to make a difference for other people. And we should never underestimate the power of a single conversation in the fight against suicide. And so I do what I do.